Uh, today, right, the, our first panel is on grading the Obama administration in uh, their, its foreign policy uh, regards. And we have a, an excellent panel uh, to, to share their analysis with us. All right, joining us on the panel, uh, St Dr. Sterling Johnson, uh, Professor of Political Science from Central Michigan University. Professor Gordon Verusich, right, Professor of Political Science from Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, Dr. Yen Bai, right, also Professor of Political Science from Grand Rapids Community College. And uh, Professor Dennis Gillum, right, uh, pr Professor of Political Science from the Grand Rapids Community College and also uh, Lieutenant Colonel, retired U.S. Army. And so we're very pleased to have all of you here to discuss this important topic, you know, a few years into the Obama administration. And I, don't, I, I, was, I find it very interesting because already, you know, two years in, the analyses of, of uh, President Obama's legacy in foreign policy is already starting to come out. And often you get this, this platitude bantered around, right, that uh, President Obama and his administration has succeeded in turning the page in U.S. foreign policy history differentiating it from the policies in, in history of the Bush administration, but, right, that he has not yet written enough on that, but that President Obama has not yet written enough on that fresh blank page. And both halves of that statement are contestable. And, and uh, so I think I'll turn it over to the panel, uh, who can all take turns sharing some introductory remarks, and then we'll open it up for discussion and debate. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm the guest, so I get yes. to go first. Oh, well, wow. okay. Maybe you're the best looking one or something like that. <laughs> this is a recording. This probably the nicest okay. guest, anyway. <laughs> well, the Obama, I, I agree that the, 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 it's too early. Nothing's been written on the tabula rasa yet of his foreign policy uh, achievements. I think he's still trying to make this choice between aggression and appeasement. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who has given him a, a score, has credited Obama with putting together an excellent, excellent foreign policy team, particularly Susan Rice at the UN and, and Hillary Clinton uh, at the State Department. However, when we look around the planet, we see that he is you know, more popular globally than he is domestically. But if I were here, I wouldn't be too much concerned about that right at this juncture. Uh, pushed the restart button with the Soviets. Things are good there. I don't think the Soviets are as uh, oppositional to us in Afghan, Af Afghanistan as they would be had he not pushed the restart button. He's finally starting to get the EU to come around and uh, join us with respect to the sanctions regime against Iran. I think they looked good, so he's made some, you know, made some progress there. Um, Still hasn't quite gotten the Karzai government to do what they you know, to do, but you know, this Karzai government, I don't think anyone can really uh, expect too much from them in the long term. And I think this may be one of the weak areas, uh, areas of his foreign policy, uh, stepping into this Afghan, Afghanistan trap. Uh, I don't think his, and this has been said many times, the options given to him by his generals were not options, that he was only given the one option. and. Um, that option is essentially to continue the, the, the policy of the previous administration. So uh, how rational a, a choice, and what kind of rational choices he can make in Afghanistan, uh, given the limited options that uh, Bob Woodward writes about in Obama's wars, uh, that's to find out. I think with respect to China, he's uh, finally starting to get some leverage with respect to the revaluation of the Rimnibi. Uh, primarily because Tokyo and, and South Korea are starting to feel some of the pain, so they're going to probably help us with these negotiations. China has started sending some signals that they might respond um, to, some, some, to some of his concerns. And uh, I really put a lot of hope that he'll be able to put some pressure on the Omar Bashir regime in the Sudan. I know he's got Susan Rice working diligently on this. And if he does have a foreign policy uh, star on the horizon and, and a, and a star feather in his cap, I think it would be getting a negotiated settlement prior to these elections that could preclude the outbreak of, a, of an, another genocide and horrible war 
and the Sudan. So and that's kind of my overview. Uh, I know there are a lot of critics, Dick Cheney, all these people are criticizing him, but I've yet to hear any credible alternatives from his major critics. Uh, when I think about Obama's foreign policy, I'm thinking about uh, where could he be placed in terms of some kind of uh, theoretical frameworks that uh, political scientists are thinking about. Is he perhaps realist, somebody who is uh, trying only to think about the interest of, however the administration may define interest of the United States? Is he somebody who is more of an idealist, somebody who is perhaps pursuing some kind of um, overarching idea about what the United States should do in terms of foreign policy? And perhaps uh, one could argue that previous Bush administration was administration of idealism because uh, they were perhaps pursuing uh, the idea of uh, the global spread of democracy by any means necessary? Or is he somebody who is perhaps a social constructivist, who is somebody who wants to uh, create uh, global communities and thus perhaps uh, introduce perhaps the cultures that uh, are seemingly in conflict with so-called Western culture and perhaps bring them uh, together, create some kind of alliances. So when I was uh, listening to Obama's speech at the University of Cairo in Egypt, he sounded to me like a constructivist. He sounded to me like somebody who wants to create some kind of um, overarching sociological community with the Muslim world. Muslim world is, I think, in uh, American security circles still perceived as uh, the world that is, that needs to be, uh, that the world, part of the world that is still, uh, has the highest danger for the United States in terms of proliferation of terrorism and possible proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Iran is seemingly pursuing weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, although my personal analysis, I think that they haven't decided yet whether to do so or not, although they're trying to scare the world into thinking that they are. And then Saudi Arabia said, well, if Iran has a nuclear weapon, then we are just going to buy one off the shelf. We don't want to produce one on our own, and they still certainly have enough money to do so. So uh, I think the start of um, Obama's foreign policy was in this, this uh, constructivist way, in, in the way of basically trying to create a community, understanding between cultures, something that if we understand each other better, then we like each other more, and therefore we will not perceive each other as threats. And if we do not perceive each other as threats, then perhaps there is a high level of collaboration. Initially, I was very afraid of that because uh, some of the feminist authors that they read are saying, well, what is power? How can you exercise power in international relations? And uh, uh, Antigner claims that you can exercise power in international relations by giving power to others. Right? By saying, well, <laughs> giving power to others through kindness. So I, was, I was afraid that perhaps Obama will turn out to be a sort of a sucker in the prisoner's dilemma game where everybody, <laughs> well, everybody will defect and he would be the only one likely to cooperate, right? But it, it, it doesn't turn out to be that way, right? And I'm saying that with regret. First of all, I'm saying that with regret because I find constructivism theoretically appealing. So construction of the communities in order to prevent future conflict seems to me like a great idea on the paper. But uh, in the politics, and I was in politics myself, it seems that sometimes this kind of approach that is outside of realism or outside of pursuing country's interest is perceived as a weakness. And if it is perceived by the weakness, those potential enemies or opponents are trying to exploit that weakness. Uh, for example, one of the best of Obama's foreign policy victories was his ability to pass the health care law despite the fact that this was uh, uh, considered primarily domestic victory, although now it doesn't look like a victory anymore because all the Democrats are running away from it. But um, to the world, it showed that he has the power, that he has the muscle 
to push something domestically. Before that, before, before um, the passage of the healthcare law, many people abroad were saying, well, how, how can he solve the world problems when despite such congressional majorities, he cannot do domestically anything really major. And, and they were saying, well, let's, let's uh, just hunker down and survive first term of Obama and for sure he will not be elected for the second term because of this perceived weakness and therefore will survive him. Um, but uh, current uh, foreign policy of Obama administration, I think, is, is showing more of a realist vein. Although I have a really difficult time in understanding what is some kind of an overarching principle of Obama's foreign policy. But it's showing more realistic vein in terms of trying in some way to define and um, pursue the interest of uh, of whatever may seem to be American foreign policy. For example, he exponentially uh, increased the number of unmanned drone attacks in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, and uh, of course, this is very opposite to his constructivist uh, intentions of creating community, because you have to create a community not only with politicians, but obviously with the wider population in these countries. And if you have a a lot of drone attacks that kill a lot of civilians that obviously doesn't doesn't work very well. He's also um, increasing the uh, American presence in Yemen. Yemen is considered to be perhaps um, a new battlefield in the war on terrorism. is a partly failed state, and it's a partly failed state. It basically opens up a great space for housing. Um, terrorist organizations, as well as Somalia. For example, if you take a look at the map of Somalia, you will see that it's a horn of Africa. So Somalia has this huge coast, very, very long coast, which is extremely difficult to control. And that's like made for creation and harboring of terrorist groups. Plus it's a failed state. The real Somali government, or whatever we think as real Somali government, is not even in Somalia, and it's in Eritrea. So uh, it's, a, it's a failed state on many different levels. So, uh, and then uh, as far as China, um, he was on the verge of uh, basically pronouncing China a currency manipulator, right? having China uh, being called a currency manipulator uh, would be something that would automatically trigger uh, at least a discussion of sanctions against China in Congress. And at the same time, he also basically, as Professor Sterling already said, managed to uh, create a very strong alliance with the European Union on the Iran issue in terms of the, in terms of the uh, uh, creating sac sanctions against Iran. Uh, but at the same time, he still keeps shying away from, uh, from engaging in Iran on any significant level. Uh, uh, however, uh, there are reports that uh, Karzai administration in Afghanistan has a very serious uh, conversation with the uh, leadership of Taliban, uh, and they are even the NATO is even shipping uh, the Taliban leadership from Afghanistan into uh, from Pakistan into Afghanistan in order for uh, uh, Taliban leadership to then this talk. So, if I have to call Obama something. I would call him a pragmatist. He's trying many things from creating communities to uh, uh, using the realist strategy of uh, pursuing whatever uh, the administration defines as the country's security interest and tries to see what sticks. Okay. I pretty much concur with uh, what uh, Gordon said, uh, that uh, you know, Obama is like a uh, pragmatist. Uh, he can be idealistic or realistic, but uh, to me, uh, in his foreign policy, uh, Obama takes like pragmatic approach uh, on the case-to-case -case basis. I think that's very good. Uh, I think that's very practical. Uh, he's not driven by any kind of um, ideology or kind of uh, Western supremacy that kind of drive. Uh, so his approach is, is uh, quite uh, well accepted, I think, to most people. 
just just like his approach in politics, domestic policies, you know, he's a centrist. Uh, to uh, his uh, policy uh, to China, I think uh, he's, uh, I think he's more, I, I think he's tougher than uh, President Bush before. I think he's uh, taking a tougher uh, stance towards the uh, Chinese government uh, on the issues like, um, you know, trade, uh, human rights. Uh, every time there is a violation uh, in China against the uh, Chinese dissident by Chinese government, he, uh, he stands up. He, he speaks on behalf of the uh, dissidents in China. Uh, he can criticize Chinese government. He, uh, he's bold enough to uh, uh, meet uh, Dalai Lama at um, the uh, White House. Um, so he's not afraid of the uh, Chinese, you know, criticism or you know that kind of strong uh, reaction. So um, I think his policy toward China I is uh, stronger, but sometimes it uh, the stronger policy uh, sometimes um, you know backfires. Um, as far as I see, uh, there are more uh, hawkish uh, officials in China uh, than before. Uh, more uh, military uh, officers generals are participating in the uh, formulation of the Chinese uh, foreign policy. Um, you know, uh, also the rise of the Chinese nationalism. Um, so as as United States becomes stronger in its stance against the uh, uh, Red China, uh, Chinese uh, sentiment of uh, nationalism is also getting stronger. Um, so I'm afraid uh, there will be more uh, frictions in this relationship between these two countries. I, I don't mean, I mean, you know, there will be like serious confrontations uh, or you know threats. I mean, challenges can be there. Uh, there are more challenges, but I don't think those challenges can become like actual, you know, security threats to the United States or even to China. Uh, a student asked me about the possibility of you know a war between the United States and China. I told him that uh, I don't see any possibility. I mean, it's difficult to figure out how a war can be started between these two countries. Uh, yes, you know, war is possible always, um, especially uh, between China and the uh, United States. I mean, Taiwan is the issue uh, between them. But I think uh, the uh, United Obama's policy toward uh, Taiwan is also becoming clearer than uh, before. Uh, before, I mean, you know, President Bush's policy of uh, deliberate uh, ambiguity, you know, we don't uh, state very clearly about the uh, ultimate status of Taiwan. I mean, you know, we don't uh, favor, you know, a two-China policy. We don't favor a policy of one China or one Taiwan. Uh, we don't support uh, Taiwan's uh, movement toward, uh, you know, declaring uh, independence. Uh, but I think United States uh, under Obama is um, more, it's getting more clearer uh, on how the uh, status of Taiwan uh, should be uh, resolved. Uh, that is, you know, United States does not permit uh, mainland China, you know, to use force to take Taiwan, to liberate Taiwan. I mean, you know, that's very clear. That's very clearly stated, clearer than before. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think Obama is also clear to what uh, the uh, uh, Taiwanese government uh, that it, that is, uh, you know, whatever you do, don't pro don't provoke, don't provoke mainland China, uh, don't provoke, don't do anything foolish, uh, you know, that can be interpreted by the mainland China as uh, a move toward the uh, de jure, you know, independence. So United States is no longer ambiguous uh, about the future of Taiwan. Um, you know, will United States uh, 
help Taiwan from uh, any possible uh, military um, uh, attack. That's clearer than before. Yes, United States uh, will protect Taiwan. I mean, but uh, another one that's not uh, clear is uh, that uh, what if uh, Taiwan declares independence? I mean, you know, United States protects Taiwan. I mean, that's because you know Taiwan has not provoked China. That's because Taiwan has not declared, but you know, mainland China used force anyway. But what if I mean, you know, Taiwan uh, uh, makes that move? So does that mean you know you're on your own? You know, you provoke China, you create this problem. So we're hands off. I mean, um, so I don't know either. But I think uh, so far, uh, so far, I mean, you know. America still de deters uh, PLA from using force, so that's that's the same thing. And um, another one is, you know, American government, you know, discouraged Taiwan from using any rhetorics to uh, to provoke China. So on that on that regard, yes, Obama's policy is uh, more uh, expressive. Than 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 uh, under uh, President Bush. I guess I'm the tail gunner. Uh, I teach my students that there anything you read or anything you hear, to include anything you hear from me, is biased, because all human beings are biased, and the trick is to find out what the bias is so that you can then listen and sort things through. Uh, so for my bias, I. I am a conservative. I often present myself as the token conservative in the social science department. Uh, I'm, I first got involved thinking seriously about foreign policy about 35 years ago when I became a Mideast war planner. Uh, and I've stayed interested. Uh, so there's a little truth in packaging. I've also run a couple of companies and figured out the truth in packaging works best. So now you understand where I'm coming from. As I was asked to be a member of this panel, I started trying to figure out for myself what I thought the theme of the Obama administration's policy was towards uh, foreign policy. And I, what I came up with was a quote, a quote as I remember it, uh, made by Mrs. Obama shortly after her husband received the Democratic Party's nomination for president. She said that she, it was the first time in her adult life that she was proud to be an American. And that's a, I think the theme of our nation's foreign policy seems to be that everything done by America prior to his election was evil. Uh, at least that's what I see. Uh, when Mr. Obama took office, the U.S. had exactly two allies that we could always count on, England and Israel. And we seem to be doing everything possible to diss them, uh, whether it's been ignoring them during visits to the United States or denying them information or support that they need or not supporting them in things that they ask for, uh, it would be hard to find a time when we even offered them more than just common courtesy. Uh, in England's case, it's the result is merely to damage a long-time relationship built on trust and with a lot of blood. Uh, in Israel's case, it makes war in the Mideast much more likely, and I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, another rather important friend is Canada, and let's talk about a recent event in the UN. Susan Rice is the US Ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, the UN just elected five new Security Council members. India, South Africa, and Colombia will begin terms this year. There, but the other two races were contested with Germany, Portugal, and Canada competing for two seats. The European Union is already represented by a veto wielding France and Britain. And either Portugal or Germany would certainly win a seat. So. It was critical from my perspective that Canada get a seat for a two for a two year term uh, to maintain a little bit of a western pers western hemisphere perspective. Uh, Canada thinks they're our friend. However, uh, Ambassador Rice's policy was directions to her staff was not to help Canada in any way. Uh, traditionally, we do work for things like that. Uh, she wasn't physically in town during this time. She was uh, on official business in Africa or somewhere, so this isn't about her. But she gave her staff direction, which they followed, to stay away, uh, not to help Canada. Uh, and that was pretty obvious, and my guess is 
that's because Canada's government is now conservative, and by keeping them off, it would be an embarrassment to Canada. I, that's the gospel according to St. Denny, not anything that I have read from someone else. Again, my bias showing. Uh, Israel's left to defend itself against a major attack from the UN after it captured a flotilla aid ship headed to the Gaza Strip, which did have weapons on it. Uh, Susan Rice didn't show up for the Marathon Emergency UN meeting, leaving Israel without its most powerful friend. It was a crucial meeting for Israel, and they were attacked by hypercritical di dictatorships. Whether, frankly, whether Israel was uh, guilty of something or not, they probably were. There are so few perfect people, I mean, besides us, there are so few perfect people in the world. Uh, but certainly attacks by Iran, Libya, Syria are not exactly the Percy Pure countries in the world, but they tore Israel up and we weren't there to help. Uh, an example might be of what I would have looked for was uh, in 2006 when then U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations John Bolton aggressively campaigned for Guatemala instead of, instead of uh, Venezuela and ultimately got Guatemala a seat. Uh, and the Obama administration proclaimed they would lead our friends and our allies. Don't see that. Uh, so I see Ms. Rice as a disaster in the UN. Again, that's my perspective. Back to Israel. Uh, Mr. Obama has created a Mideast peace conference. In August, Secretary of State Clinton announced that she'd invited Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, Palestinian Authority President Abbas, uh, in September to Washington to relaunch negotiations. It was going to be a two-state solution, which is reasonable. Israel and the Palestine state sharing the turf, and also invited were Egyptian President Mubarak and Jordan's King Abdullah. And because those two countries certainly play a key role in all this, certainly an appropriate gathering, but who wasn't at the meeting? Hamas, the armed Arabs. They didn't want to come. I have no idea if they were invited or not, as far as I know they weren't, but I, I would guess they were, but they didn't come. Now, I'm just a, a guy who ducked bullets for a living for 22 years, but my perspective, and I was the Mideast war planner, and not to assign all fault in any direction, because that just never happens, but if all Hamas and their friends immediately stopped trying to kill Jews, probably there would be peace in that area. If all Jews immediately disarmed themselves, there'd probably be only dead Jews in the area. So I don't see any, a lot of debate on that, yet we're not, what we're doing is we basically forced the Prime Minister of Israel to show up at a conference which could produce nothing on the off chance that we just might support him when he either attacks Iran or Iran attacks him. Uh, in, in, in that area, uh, while it's not ever announced publicly or officially, almost everybody who studies in the area knows that Saudi Arabia has made available to Israel a military airfield uh, which they can use to strike Iran to take out their nuclear production facilities. Uh, several other Arab countries in the region have supported that. Of course, they don't do this publicly, but they actually have because Israel has a rather long flight to get their bombers to and from, back and forth, refueling and restocking without that kind of support. And Saudi Arabia has made the airfield available uh, because there's little doubt in any of their minds or mine that Iran, one, is producing Materi nuclear material that is weapons grade. Uh, as was pointed out, nobody knows for sure that they're going to make nuclear weapons out of those, but they certainly want us to, th well, one, we know they could, and they want us to know they could, and they're pulling the world's chain like all foreign policy programs are scheduled to do. Uh, you've got to pull the other people's chain. But if you're Israel, and if you believe that if a nuclear weapon is made, the first one will land on you, this is not an academic discussion. Uh, and as one who's been downrange before, I know what that's like. So there is very little doubt in my mind. Indeed, I would go to say to the fact there is no doubt in my mind. I might say my military mind. My wife tells me to use that phrase periodically when I'm talking like this. Uh, that Israel is going to strike Iran before they get that weapons-grade material to full readiness. It is expected that they will strike. 
in the past when they have done things like that, about two years ago right now, they struck a weapons of mass destruction storage area in Syria. Uh, the Israeli fighters flew completely over Syria, bombed, and came all the way back. Uh, Syria had just installed a very high-grade, brand-new Russian-made anti-air defense system. They didn't even know they were up there. It wasn't they were jammed. They didn't even know they were there because the United States Air Force showed up with a few toys that they let the Air Force, the Israeli Air Force use, which jammed all that stuff. Uh, the, Isra the, the Syrians found out what had happened there when they read about it in the Israeli newspapers. I mean, they knew the thing blew up, but they didn't know why. And since Iran had the same air defense system, that was a message to Iran. It's very clear to everybody, I think, that we're not going to provide that kind of help. Uh, indeed, Iran has purchased but not received delivery on the newest upgrades to the Russian's air defense system. And one of the big questions is, is Russia going to withhold that or not? Typically, Russia, nobody, Russia, the United States, nobody sells the very best, latest stuff you have. You might take the money for it, but you don't deliver it until you've developed something better because you don't want anybody else having as good as you do. Uh, the one thing that would stop all this, if the, uh, the only country in the world that could interfere here and stop this strike by Iran or on Iran is the United States. We have the military power to go in and tell Iran stop it or we'll bomb or negotiate whatever, but not just talk, have to produce results. No one knows how long this nuclear fission up enrichment process is going to take, but everybody knows it'll be less than a year. Nobody knows how much less because we aren't monitoring how fast and how much they're doing. The U.S. could do that. No one else could. Clearly, we're not going to. Uh, Mr. Obama has made it clear that he'll talk with Iran. That's good. But probably his only major, in my opinion, foreign policy successes have been uh, in getting Russia and a couple other countries to vote with the United States in condemning Iran and the UN. We well, got the condemnation, but Iran laughed it off. So we don't know what good that did. Uh, and the price was incredible. Uh, some countries had promised the United States under the Bush administration that they would house anti-missile defense systems in Eastern European countries that would be aimed to stop Iranian missiles should they be launched. But of course, they'd also stop, could stop Russian ones. So we had, to, we had to leave those people hanging and pull out of that in order to get Russia's support. Uh, wow. Uh, so are we more popular in the world? Well, uh, was it two months ago that uh, the Iranian uh, Aminajad addressed the UN General Assembly? He placed the responsibility for 9-11 on America and Israel and called for an international investigation into the terrorist attacks of 2001. I'm glad to say that uh, the U.S. delegation walked out of this blowhard speech. However, we were alone walking out. If we're really popular, why weren't other people walking out? Now, it, we were not alone. There were a couple other countries to walk to. Uh, I have a tendency for overstatement. My wife keeps reminding me, and I, I keep trying to. Uh, so back to our neighbors. Canada, we wouldn't support them in their bid. So how about Mexico? We are regularly, almost daily, being invaded by Mexico. The Mexican government is losing a fight against uh, drug cartels that are fighting each other, too. The Mexican army is being regularly ambushed and defeated by dr drug cartels who are now running convoys into the United States across the border, usually in, in Arizona, that would compete with the kind of convoys we run in Afghanistan and Iraq. They have that high-tech gunnery. They have the high-tech communications. They have the, they have the all that sort of stuff. They're killing Americans. Uh, isn't that foreign policy? Uh, I, I think so. The only thing that I know that has happened in that in the area of foreign policy is that Secretary of Clinton, speaking in South America, called Arizona racist. Okay. Um, let me conclude militarily. Uh, throughout history, well, no, since World War II, or since Korea anyway, the United States has owned the skies. Uh, our fighters, fighter bombers, uh, the technology, the training, the whole thing, virtually no one can compete with us. I use the example of the Israeli flight over, over, over Syria. Uh, virtually no one can compete with our technology. Uh, my two years in combat in Vietnam as an infantryman, if I looked up and there was something up there, it was friendly. That changed, that made my life a whole lot safer. 
last month, the Secretary of Defense announced that we were stopping all development on air supremacy weapon systems immediately because we needed the money. We couldn't afford it anymore. Well, I can assure you this, and, and we're also stopping any development future for the Navy. China is, is building a very modern Navy and a very modern Air Force. Oh, they're using the money that we're paying them as interest on the money we borrowed from. That's where, so we're paying for an increased military, but we're not getting it. We are the only superpower. We will soon not be. As the only superpower, we're sort of the cop for the nation, for the world. Sort of a, not a good job. But if we, when we pull out, who takes over? It creates a vacuum. Who's going to step in? I only see one choice, and that's China. Uh, final, I guess, final, final, uh, just in, 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 in conclusion, uh, for those of you who aren't local, one right across the street to the south is the Grand Rapids Public Library. Right across the street to the south of them is Grand Rapids Veterans Memorial Park. Until two years ago, about once a semester, there was a protest there against the war. I used to go over because I wanted with other veterans to make sure they didn't deface the statues and stuff. There hasn't been one in two years. I wonder why. Could it be that it's all political, or did President Obama, part of his foreign policy, make war good? We don't know. Anyway, uh, I am negatively impressed by what I see. I see the world as a more dangerous place. I see America losing both strength and respect. And I think it's a good place to stop. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our panel. I, I, I personally thank you for giving us a lot to, to consider and, and to discuss. And just as, as, a, as, as I'm thinking about each of your, your, your successive turns, uh, I should beg your forgiveness before I go further because I'm a historian. And I'll beg the indulgence of my poli-sci colleagues here by, by bringing a historical perspective right, to, as, as a question. It'll take me a minute to get to it, but I've been thinking about it uh, uh, take your time, since this started. <laughs> but uh, for, in terms of U.S. foreign policy, one of the main starting points in, the, in, in our discussions in history is William Appleman Williams' book, the, the Tragedy of U.S. Foreign Relations. And you know, famously, he's argued that there are three classic motivations for U.S. foreign policy, and that is our uh, commitment to democracy and self-determination. And the second one is our, our desire for economic stability and growth. And the third, of course, is our, our need for security. And Williams has argued that historically, the, the last two causations or motives for foreign policy, our desire for economic stability and growth and our commitment to security, have negated the first one. Right? Our, our commitment to democracy and self-determination always is put on the back burner right, when the other two uh, uh, conflict with it. And that's the tragedy, right? That our beautiful ideals are, are subverted, right, in the name of uh, money and, and uh, security. And with President Obama's administration, what always struck a lot of people about his his uh, his speeches, and also the official statement of his foreign policy that is on the, the White House webpage and so on, is that he intends to reconcile all three, and 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 to let all three of those classic motivations. It's, it actually reads in the White House webpage like a response to William Appleman mean, Williams two generations later, uh, that he wants to have a, a, an equal commitment to our commi our. our commitment to democracy, our, our need for, for economic stability and growth, and of course our, our need for security. And that is his goal, as it is stated, right? An equal commitment to all three. And many critics of President Obama's foreign policy argue that his foreign policy has, like, has largely been characterized by inaction, and, or at least frustrated action. And I'm wondering if there's a connection there between those two. If you try to do all three, it's noble. But how possible is it? Is, is it trying to do all three that leads to inaction, whereas other administrations in the past have taken an easier way and been willing to subvert our commitment to democracy in the name of economics or, or security? And President Obama's administration refuses to do that, and the result is that it makes foreign policy a hell of a lot harder uh, to come to a coherent uh, strategy. I'm just wondering, you know, given that those goals are stated, right, are they possible? Have we seen any examples of all three goals, right, being, being implemented? And, and I wanted to get the panel's thoughts, thoughts on that. I, I think it's possible, but I, I think the problem is how these 
uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy is uh, perceived. Uh, I mean, for example, in Asian countries, in China, for example, uh, you know, foreign policy of the United States is always perceived as aggressive. Uh, you know, uh, taking the economic interests uh, first. Uh, spreading democracy is not uh, the real uh, concern or motive of the U.S. government uh, in Asian countries. I mean, uh, there are many. Uh, there were many uh, opportunities in the past uh, that China could be, you know, democratic uh, with help from the United States. But all of those uh, opportunities uh, just uh, just went away. I mean, you know, because. Uh, in those opportunities, for example, uh, uh, 1919, I mean, you know, uh, the, the Versailles Treaty was signed. I mean, uh, you know, the treaty uh, transferred the uh, concession, the territory of China, of Shandong province uh, from uh, Germany to uh, Japan. I mean, uh, in 1919, uh, you know, the country was very much uh, in the desire uh, for uh, Western ideas, uh, you know, democracy, science, uh, the young people, intellectuals, uh, students were like uh, embracing, you know, anything from the West. But all of a sudden, I mean, you know, that, that treaty really shocked the country. I mean, Chinese people believe, you know, they were betrayed. I mean, you know, in the name of democracy, uh, anything could be solved for the real economic uh, interest of the Western countries. That's just one example. Uh, there are some others. So I think the perception is really uh, more important than uh, reality. It's, it's not what you want, it's how you are uh, perceived. Bob, I think your, <coughs> your historical perspective uh, should be really taken seriously. And with the election of Obama, we see a radical shift in American history. Up until Obama, our foreign policy has always been closely linked to that of our British cousins. That is to say, we have always had an Anglophile foreign policy. This has nothing to do with Africa and the shift in, in the focus from Africa to a focus on, well, a shift from Europe to a focus on Africa and Latin America and Asia. The elected people, the American people elected, when they elected President Obama, probably didn't perceive this subtle shift that the tail has always wagged the dog. The reason, you know, David Balfour was an Englishman. We're in, we're tied up in this conflict in the Middle East because of David Balfour, a British foreign secretary. This is the first time that we have not looked first to England in terms of our foreign policy direction. The Germans felt, feel, feared uh, Anglo domination of our foreign policy during the colonial era, as did the Dutch as did all of the other American ethnic groups. From the beginning of our history, all the other American ethnic groups have feared Anglo domination of U.S. foreign policy. Africans, Italians, Dutch, Greeks, every group in America. So this is the first time in American history that the English tail has not wagged the dog. And so a lot of people see this as, as fearful. But if we, if we look at the financial crisis, the west of Europe, has said oh, the financial crisis was caused not by just capitalism and venture capitalism. It was the, the rest of the Europeans say, we don't have any problem with venture capitalism. It is the vulture capitalism practiced by England and the United States. And so they have distanced themselves in terms of foreign policy. So when we start looking at the Basel Accords and all these other agreements, Anglo-American capitalism is being differentiated from the capitalism practiced by the West of Europe, Anglo domination. There's this nexus between England and America. This is what many people find threatening. We can talk about spreading democracy, but now we might be talking about spreading economic democracy as opposed to political democracy, a great contradiction, the one that you have already alluded to. When we look at his, our foreign policy in Israel, uh, we know here that President uh, Bibi Netanyahu has never really wanted to make peace with the Palestinians. The fact that Obama has gotten him to come to the table to even initiate discussions is a major accomplishment. Now he might he's not going to live. He can't stop the moratorium. He can't stop the moratorium on the uh, uh, extend the moratorium on building his these settlements. He'll be gone. They might he might end up dead like Yitzhak Rabin. He can't make such a move. That man's in a really tight place. But the mere fact that he's at the negotiating table is a major 
as a major accomplishment. We have to look at, when we look at, um, at, at, at you know, the, 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 Israel, the state of Israel, as Car Jimmy Carter uh, has, has observed and many others, we're talking here about a minority of the people of Israel who don't pay any taxes, who don't serve in the military, but who dictate and dominate foreign policy and domestic policy in that country. This is not a democracy. We're not talking about a democracy. We're talking about a minority of people who are building these settlements in opposition to the domestic policy, domestic law, global opinion, Israeli public opinion. So I think we need to keep a focus on the political reality rather than ideological uh, con uh, considerations. Uh, I, I think that uh, so-called beautiful idea about spreading democracy has become less beautiful and more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, spreading democracy, I think, in, especially in the Iraq war, was primarily based on this um, democratic peace theory, which starts from the observation that uh, at least developed democracies do not fight each other, which basically means uh, there are no wars between developed democracies that have more than a thousand casualties. And, and they have supposedly never fought each other. There's some criticism about that, but uh, I will skip the details about that. Uh, however, more recent research has shown that uh, early democracies, democracies that are just starting out, such as Iraq of, I don't know, I'm scared to call Afghanistan democracy. But <laughs> <laughs> Let's say Iraq democracy, which is also a bit scary. These early democracies or nascent democracies have a much higher level of violence, civil violence within their own societies. Uh, and then this, then it became very complicated because democracy, the development of democracy is a fairly long process. And then early parts of the process create a very high cost in terms of high level of violence, high level of casualties. And then there is also assumption that early democracies or nascent democracies are more likely to start wars with uh, perhaps their neighbors because they may need war as a political tool for unifying society around, around a certain thing. And, and then secondly, uh, developing democracies have become a part of cost-benefit analysis. And it's extremely costly and it's extremely tiresome to build democracy. And I think uh, the United States uh, has withdrawn from Iraq uh, after the so-called surge, which didn't really produce <laughs> uh, mature democracy, but still uh, Iraq is struggling in this early democracy. So, uh, and in order to produce quick results, the mature democracies need to show something for it. And the thing they show is elections. And if you have elections, therefore you have democracy. But that's not how democracies work, really. Because uh, if you have elections in a country that is divided among three, essentially, tribes, Kurds, Sunnis, and Shia, like in Iraq, then voters are not going to vote to, uh, for political candidates that represent certain ideologies. Ideologies are a manifestation of mature democracies. Right? Uh, people are going to vote for political parties that uh, represent their uh, sectarian nationality or tribal, uh, sectarian identity or tribal identity. I mean, we had the same thing in Bosnia, right? And I, I was always puzzled why it is that the United States didn't learn anything from Bosnia by forcing elections in Iraq so early. In Bosnia, in elections in 92, Croats, uh, we're voting for a Croatian nationalist parties and Muslims for Muslim nationalist parties and Serbs for Serbian national parties. And I was there, <laughs> so I remember. <laughs> but, uh, but if you have elections before creating institutions, you will inevitably have a civil war because uh, uh, these political parties are not going to uh, be interested in building common good for all uh, inhabitants of a particular society these nationalistic political parties will be interested in uh, basically creating as much political space and as much economic space for them as possible, and uh, therefore will only worsen the conditions for the civil war than, than, than basically establish it, as it happened in Bosnia, as it happened in, in Iraq, right? So, um, uh, but, uh, but if you say, oh, well, wait a minute, let's wait for, let's wait for 10 years and develop something called 
classical liberal values, which are the rule of law, separation of powers, and uh, peaceful resolution of conflicts, right? You don't have time or resources to do that. And right? uh, people, voters in uh, mature democracies who are capable of, or at least think they're capable of trying to develop democracies in so-called non-democratic places, and it results right now, or, <laughs> or they will not support the particular government. So um, uh, it has become very problematic, and I'm very happy that President Obama is not mentioning building of democracies in his foreign policy speeches. I think it's a great idea. If democracy has to grow uh, from the values of the community, yes, and yes, uh, yes. rather than being imposed, yes, yes. imposed yes. from from uh, from the outside. Wow, I agree with almost everything I just heard. Uh, there are two democracies in the Middle East, uh, or at least two countries with a thousand years of history of democracy, and that's Turkey and Iran. Neither are currently functioning democracies, but they, they developed a demo democratic culture over the years. And if there's two countries that are liable to, could possibly produce a democracy by the Joe American's definition of democracy, it's those two countries with perhaps not too much more than what they have, given that their current leadership may not agree with that. Uh, democracies take a long time to develop, and one of the things that took me a long time to understand is that's that just because I want something for you doesn't mean you want it. And my making you have it isn't necessarily a good thing from your perspective. <laughs> uh, it sort of goes back to the ugly American thing, that we've got it made. And if you don't have it, you must want it. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. So yes, encouraging democracy, as long as we don't define democracy as much more than giving the people a way to express their will somehow, uh, we need to be a little careful about that. And yes, it's a very long, tedious process. And early results can't be, for well, you can force anything. But good results don't come by forcing anything early. And yes, we have a tendency to try to force things, a la elections, way too early. We need to appro approach it slowly. But yes, I do agree that the foreign policy pro approach of encouraging democracy, though I don't think I know I know what that means right now, uh, is an awfully good thing. So uh, other questions or, or comments uh, on the Obama administration's uh, foreign policy? I'll pass the mic around, because again, we are recording for the uh, internet. Cheap shots. <laughs> Th thank you, panelists. Uh, I, I think that there's a big elephant in the room that hasn't been mentioned, and, and it may be a little simplistic, but it's the previous eight years before Obama. This administration, quite frankly, inherited a pretty serious foreign policy mess. If war can be justified, one might justify the war in Afghanistan. When you look at just war theory very carefully, that might be justifiable. But clearly what happened in March 2003 uh, intellectual um, uh, apologies to Professor Gillum uh, here. Uh, the, the war in Iraq was not justifiable. It was illegal, and quite frankly, it was immoral. And and it had very little international support. That that is very clear. So I, I would like the panelists to address uh, the changes that Obama has tried to make relative to the counter-terror policies, and those include by the way, supporting very undemocratic governments. You started with Karzai alone in, uh, in Afghanistan. But, but, but going very directly to not inviting Hamas, had Obama invited Homa Hamas, and maybe he had, maybe he didn't, what would, what would the talking heads on the TV say about that? Well, he's trying to deal with terrorists. Yes. So I think it's a little simplistic to put it in those terms without talking about those previous uh, eight years. So I would uh, appreciate comment. Thank you. I, I think one of the changes I think one of the changes uh, by uh, Obama is that uh, he does not use the word uh, terror, a war against terror, or war on terror. Uh, I think he realized terrorism is a, is a technique, it is a method. Uh, so that's just one of them. I agree. How do you declare a war 
on a tactic. How do you clear war on a strategy? You don't. However, when you look at our continued support of minority Sunni regimes all across the region, in this way we are, he is consistent with his predecessor. The, I'm certain um, that St. Ambrose and St. Augustine would agree that the war on Af in Afghanistan, on Afghanistan, with Afghanistan is a just war, but not, not the war in Iraq. No way could this war have been justified. This was, this was clearly one of the wars that Eisenhower warned us about, a uh, product of the military industrial complex, a war that basically was designed to continue what we have as a permanent war economy, a war that deals subtly with questions of unemployment, that keeps the arms industry and the arms merchants working. I mean, why is the Pentagon being forced to purchase weapon systems by the Congress that they don't want? Clearly, we're not, there's no threat from China. China does not want hegemonic status. China is reluctant to accept the new power that we say that they are about to uh, take. They don't want it. They don't, they don't have the leadership. China has its own domestic problems. They've got a, a, a rising middle class that's going to give them problems. Half these people are still in, in, in poverty. They've got weather challenges, water challenges. They're not, they're not ready to step up on the global sea. They may want to extend their influence and have made a greater control in the South China Sea. That's where they're building their fleet, perhaps to challenge the hegemony of the Seventh Fleet in that region. But it is high more, highly much high, more likely that China will have a war with India or have a war with any of their other neighbors and they will, uh, then they will have a war with the United States. That's largely a remote possibility. And so I think, that, uh, for, you know, the, the president has tried to close Guantanamo. This has been more prob problematic. Uh, but he has essentially made a rapprochement with, uh, with, with the Islamic world a good thing. We've seen less threats, even though Osama bin Laden has turned the rhetoric down a little bit and they started talking about you know, aid to relief uh, victims, victims of the flood and as opposed to uh, more strikes against the United States. Uh, Ahmadinejad is just well, a little bit off of his rocker, so we have to take every, you know, we really only take what he says with a grain of salt. Any man who said he's the 12th Imam and he saw this thing in the UN, you don't take this guy seriously anyway. So if you, his, 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 his threats to Israel and his, his, his crazy rantings about uh, ourselves being involved in, our, in the implosion of, of, of the, the Twin Towers, no one takes this seriously. And uh, I think the president can deal with other people more seriously. We're, you know, all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but we've made rapprochement even with, with, with uh, Muammar Gaddafi. And Muammar Gaddafi was at one time seen way f further out on the lunatic fringe than Ahmadinejad is. So I'm, I'm still optimistic. I guess I'm up, huh? Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you, you can pretty much tell where I'm going to start. I don't disagree with some of the things that is much, unless we go over there, the probability of China and the United States fighting is not compared to them with Russia or to them in India or something like that. Uh, neighbors tend to fight each other. That's what good neighbors do, I guess. Uh, the war in the Mideast. Uh, I, Which war in the Mideast? Well, okay, good. The first Gulf War, uh, I know a lot about because I think I wrote the plans that were ultimately used to conduct it. I felt were, well, the UN was involved and everybody else, I mean, it, it, it had all the magic buttons on it. So I, and by some criteria, we actually won it, or somebody won it, but it wasn't Iraq. On the other hand, Iraq still did what they wanted. So well, we did that. Uh, then what happened at the end of the war was that Saddam agreed that he would, under UN supervision, that one of the conditions of surrender, under UN supervision, he would have his weapons of mass destruction and their production facilities and their transportation facilities destroyed, removed, eliminated, moved away, whatever. He never permitted that to happen. He never permitted UN inspectors to show up anywhere. A uh, number of books have been written on the subject. Uh, 
They're in town. We want to inspect this site. Okay, we'll take you over there day after tomorrow or next week, and you can only see half of it, that kind of thing. So uh, when you're talking about somebody who, one, has had weapons of mass destruction, has used them on both himself, the Kurds, and his neighbors, Iran, and he won't permit any inspections, it probably is rational to say, and indeed virtually every intelligence agency in the world agreed that Saddam probably had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so should we have gone in there? Uh, first, I agree with my colleagues that a war on terror is a rather, is stupid okay term? I don't want to offend anybody if I, you, you don't declare war on concepts. Out. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, you don't declare war on concepts. The war, if there is a war, is against radical Islam. They are the ones who st probably started in 1972 with the attack on the Israeli athletes in, in the Munich Olympics, and were, amb were hijacking ships, uh, blew up, tried to blow up the USS Cole, attacked our embassies. An attack on an embassy is an act of war. An attack on a, a warship is an act of war. Uh, we've been at war since somewhere in the 70s. We, nobody called it that. Uh, Bush called it the War on Terror, which I didn't think a lot of, but nobody asked me. Uh, but then we decided to go in. There is not a lot of question. If you are a study of, uh, if you are a student of the of the uh, the Muslim Arab Islam. Islamic Arab culture, but even I guess it's got to be the, the Mid Eastern Islamic culture, uh, because the two real ones which could be democracies over there, Turkey and Iran are not Arab. Uh, one, we kept looking and saying, well, look, they didn't have any big meetings to do this. In that culture, you don't do that. Uh, and they didn't sign these accords. In that culture, you don't do that. Uh, so we were sitting here waiting to s see if they were plotting against us. Well, of course they were. Uh, they had been at war with us for some time. Uh, not in the coordinated way that a nation state does, but certainly war was going on. And where was the bulk of the encouragement, the money, the everything coming from? Well, two places, Iran, Iraq. If you know much about the geography of Iran, I don't know how you invade it. Uh, the lowlands are almost uninhabitable deserts, and everybody lives in the highlands. One of the reasons Iran has trouble controlling their own people is because they're all mountain villages and they're all so damned independent everywhere in the world that paying attention to the next village is something much less somebody who calls themselves the central government. So if you decided you were going to attack, how in the world would you do it? That leaves Iraq. Uh, Iran at that time was not nuclear, or nuclear is the wrong word, not at weapons of mass production use. Iraq was. And clearly, a great deal was coming out of Iraq in the sense of money support, training, all kinds of things. We had been attacked. There's every indication that the attacks would continue. Uh, doing something made sense, and taking out one of the two kingpins made sense. Uh, if we had decided, well, you know, Maybe we'll just negotiate. Uh, find me a time in history when somebody in the bully role negotiated away a power position. Or somebody not in a bully role. <laughs> so find me a time in history when anybody had power and gave it away. Uh, what if then, and who knows, Saddam did use one of his weapons of mass destruction on someone. Then everybody would, of course, accuse Bush of being an idiot for not going in. One of the, th one of the quotes, I think, who quoted the book, Obama's War? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the quotes in it was, I don't know why anybody wants to be president now. <laughs> and boy, do I understand and do I agree with that? <laughs> uh, so Bush, Nomer, by so, the way. so Bush, Bush made a decision that I think was a wise one. His execution of it was horrible. Uh, and we could talk about that forever, but that's not the purpose of this of, of this uh, this event. So, did he leave a mess? Yep. Uh, was it getting better? I think so. Uh, is there a clear golden solution 
to that area? Well, I have a few ideas, but I don't pretend to. If, if, if I thought they were any good, I'd be on my yacht in the Caribbean living off the royalties of all my, all my great writing. So did he inherit a war? Yep. Uh, did he? How come it's not going better? Maybe we should ask General McChrystal, the only known active general officer who voted for Obama, who got fired for saying things that no general is too smart enough to ever say and get caught at. Get caught at. That's the operative word. Uh, I think he inherited a tough situation, but a good, but one that was in a, was the fruit of good people trying to do the right thing. I think they were trying to do the right things. Uh, they were executed imperfectly, some of them really poorly, uh, but nothing that he didn't know about. And I would like Mr. Obama at some point to stop blaming Bush for everything, including the inoperative dishwasher at the White House. I don't know that I answered your question, but I think I'm at the point where I'm starting to ramble. Uh, yeah. I think, I think, uh, uh, Obama said many times that he is not waging war on terrorism and his method, terrorism is a method to fight, not really an enemy. But he's still waging war against uh, terrorist organizations. That's why he says that he is in Afghanistan. That's why increasing uh, military advisor and uh, troop presence in Yemen. That, that's why there is uh, military advisors and troop presence in Somalia. Because these are all failed or semi-failed states that uh, house there's organization. Where is Obama better than Bush in that particular sense? I think in a very simple thing, Obama is much better at creating international alliances to do that. And he is not, uh, at least not publicly, ever said that the United States is uh, pursuing accept American exceptionalism in foreign policy. And uh, for Europeans and a bunch of European academics who criticize uh, the United States until they got sabbatical year at Harvard, and that's something that uh, is very appealing. It's uh, Obama is, um, despite the fact that some critics are saying, well, he is uh, distant and aloof and so on and so forth, but he is a much better um, coalition maker because he gives uh, uh, apparent uh, respect and attention to those he can uh, use in political goals. Thank you. I apologize. Hold it close. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I apologize for being tardy. A uh, little bit of construction on the way from Lansing. I have four questions that I'd like you to address. I'll ask them all at once. Uh, one, Hillary Clinton's role in the, um, in the foreign policy effort and the image of the United States in the Obama administration as juxtaposed to the Bush administration and its efforts. Uh, question on Medvedev in uh, Russia, and what are we doing in the United States to promote uh, more transparency there with their, their uh, media and the concerns of the free press in, in the Russian Federation? Uh, Kim Jong-il in North Korea, a transition going on there. Uh, what foreign policy do you see as an opportunity for the United States to grow in that area? And lastly, the drug, uh, the drug effort uh, in Mexico on our border at our, our, most, our most close, our, our closest foreign country uh, with that border, uh, aside from Canada, but some real critical issues with, with drugs that was uh, just recently ex exploded in the media with the death of uh, a jet skier. Thank you. Wow, four softballs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we should divide only one for one. Yeah, right. take, one, take one at a time. Which one do you want? I'll start with Mexico. Uh, the, I believe we need to defend our southern border. I believe we are being invaded by a foreign, a foreign military, but again, it's a terrorist group, not a, not a, not a national group, but an invasion is an invasion. Organized criminals. Organized criminals, yes, sir, exactly. You know, uh, it, it wasn't that long ago that we all knew about the Colombian drug cartel and the mafia. They've been run out of the country, not peacefully, by the, by the Mexican drug cartels. Uh, they don't like each other, but they have 
and again, nothing is 100% anything, but they are very dangerous, well, very well organized, very rich uh, organization, and they have totally destabilized their home nation. And we need a foreign policy that will recognize that we have, not in the country of Mexico, but organizations in that turf that are hostile to the United States. And we need to be defending our southern border. Uh, I think that is a policy that we need to step up to very quickly. And whatever that means, dig a trench, build a fence, uh, put troops down there, radar coverage, whatever it is, uh, they're abusing us bad, and it's going to get worse. How's that for a short well, answer? I like that. And I would add, we also need to look at our own domestic policy. We need to look at the Arms yes. Control Export Act. So, okay, under our own Constitution, and our own uh, congressional legislation. Here we are. Most of the, all these guns are coming from the United States, right? So it's an issue of gun control. So here we are financing terror against ourselves. We need to look at our own drug laws, and we need to really reform and look at the relationship between our exports of guns. Because remember, our number one export is therefore death. That's the thing we sell most to the world: net weapon systems. So if our number one export is death. We need to take a look at that very carefully because it's coming back to haunt us from our southern border. We won't control arms here, and the result is that all these arms flow across the border and come and threaten our citizens of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Texas, and, and California. So you can't delink these this issue from domestic gun production and export of arms, even though we have legislation that's supposed to preclude it. These criminals are getting around it, and our own domestic criminals, in terms of the arms producers, are, are profiting it from it. So we really, you know, we, we, there's two sides of this story, and we're on both sides of it. So then, uh, I guess with respect to the, I guess my, the one out, what was you had, you had, you did uh, Korea, Korea, Russia, the Russia one. Well, I. I think this relationship with Medvedev is uh, an interesting one. He is not, and I don't think he ever has been, in control of his country. I think he's always been sort of a puppet in the wings, waiting for Putin. You know, they fire the mayor of Moscow, nobody can say anything about it, because the mayor of Moscow might have challenged Putin. Um, President Bush said he looked into Putin's eyes and saw the man's soul. Obama didn't go so far. He didn't, you know, he said, look, look. Well, they put serious sanctions on uh, media dissidents over there, no question. Uh, and of course, we're probably about the polar opposite because we can have total, we have a channel that it engages in disinformation and, and in political campaigning. So I think we need to strike a balance. Now, they have to strike a balance, but we also could use some recalibration here in terms of disinformation. We, we, you know, we, our, our media may beat up a politician. We may have channeled MSNBC and Fox, I'm speaking of both of them, both of them kind of nuts in terms of beating up on the opposition. But they don't kill uh, media, no media person. Out, out of window. No, right. right, no one goes out of a window. And so uh, we don't have much leverage in terms of what, what we can do, and I don't think that's a real high priority. Uh, getting uh, more democratic media and in Moscow. I don't think that's been any president's purview or foreign policy interest. The best thing we can, I think the best thing we can hope is just that we keep Moscow from hurting our efforts in Afghanistan, which I think uh, they could do, because I think there's still a little historic desire for vengeance for our undermining their effort back when they were fighting the Mujahideen. And so if we can just keep them at bay from really undermining our current, our, our, our current war effort there, I'd be satisfied with that. Uh, uh, let me, uh, sorry. 
I, uh, I would like to uh, answer your question on uh, North Korea, North Korean's uh, successor, uh, Kim Jong Un. Well, there are two names. Uh, you know, his first name uh, is pronounced An, uh, Kim Jong An, uh, but uh, in Asian country, uh, his name is Yin, Kim Jong In. But anyway, I mean, uh, he's young. He's 24 years old. Uh, so, some people say, I mean, for the young. People like him. I mean, you know, he's uh, impressionable. He's receptive of the new ideas, uh, but I don't think that way because he's um, he has a lot of tutors. He has mentors. He has his relatives. He has a circle teaching him to to rule to rule uh, North Korea. Uh, but I I think in the long run, uh, North Korea uh, is still hopeful. Um, hopeful in the sense that uh, uh, North Korea can be united. <laughs> With uh, South Korea, uh, I think that's the trend. Uh, well, you no, know, the unification of these two Koreas, uh, you know, is that is that beneficial to the United States? Is that a good thing? I, mean, uh, I think that's good. Uh, of course, you know, if these two uh, Koreas are united, unified, uh, there is no reason for the uh, U.S. troops to be stationed there because the sole purpose for us to be there is to prevent North Korea from attacking on the south. Some people say, I mean, the purpose there is to prevent uh, China. I don't think that's the original purpose. So if it's uh, the case uh, in the long run, in the future, I mean, United States has to uh, withdraw. They have to go, they have to leave. So uh, there is a possibility that uh, this United uh, Korea, the you know, one Korea, the Korea uh, Peninsula, will be under the uh, sphere of influence of China. So this Korea will be, uh, you know, uh, ban uh, join the bandwagon uh, you know, with China rather than balancing, uh, balancing against China. So it's part of China's uh, sphere. Um, again, again, the question is, uh, is, that, is that still good? Uh, that, well, that's not good, but you know, so what? Because you know, uh, you know, United States still has Japan. You know, Japan still the uh, ally. United States, uh, United States still has the uh, strong uh, naval uh, foot uh, foot uh, hold uh, on the uh, South China Sea. You know the sea lane. You know for navigation because the uh, Middle East uh, oil are shipped pretty much on that area through that area, and also the allies in uh, you know uh, south part of uh, Asia in the Singapore, the Philippines, and uh, Thailand. Uh, so so as United States uh, get uh, this strong ally with Japan, uh, that should be no problem. We are uh, running out of time a little bit, and I see that Professor Vrusic is, is waiting there very patiently uh, to, to offer his contribution. So I think we'll, we'll have to, to end with uh, Professor Vrusic's uh, comments. Okay, just let me comment on, on Russia and then on Hillary Clinton. Uh, during Yeltsin era in Russia, first, first post-Soviet president Yeltsin, uh, there was a number of uh, private radio and especially television stations in Russia. And uh, why? I, I think you have to look at uh, uh, domestic politics, politics in Russia in order to understand the reason. And uh, the main uh, circle of friends or the main circle of political and economic collaborators and the people who were financing uh, pres Yeltsin's presidency were financial tycoons, right? And these financial tycoons were former uh, Soviet party officials who basically stole the money from uh, uh, local communist parties and uh, communist companies and then bought these companies and sold them for parts and then they opened banks and gave loans to the government and when the government couldn't pay back the loans then government gave them more of these companies right so in order to return the favor yeltsin was financing uh, their media uh, media empires right but when putin came over he aligned himself with, uh, with a different crowd he's aligned with the uh, uh, former KGB and security officials, right? In Russian, they call them silniki, which means powerful man. <laughs> and of course, uh, he, if you look at authoritarian countries in general, you see that authoritarian countries are learning their lesson. Previously, in, er, fairly, in early post-war communism, what you had is basically forbidding of both economic freedoms and political freedoms, because economic, if you didn't have economic freedom, that means you didn't have the money, you didn't have the education, you didn't have the ability to organize yourself against the regime. And then the political freedom, of course, political freedom is exchange of information. That's also necessary for the creation of collective action. But for example, places like China and Russia started to understand 
that you really can uh, you can really basically curb uh, political freedom without curbing economic freedom, right? Because if people have the opportunity to get rich, uh, they're not really interested anymore in the political freedom. I see that every day in my students, right? <laughs> When I ask them how many of you will ever notice that we cancel elections, not many of them would ever notice. <laughs> right? So uh, this is how these countries are playing. And then, however, what is more dangerous is, is political freedom, political freedom of exchanging information. Right? In order to organize a movement for undermining the regime, you need to have the information. And who is spreading the information? The media are. Therefore, uh, basically, uh, Putin and Medvedev later, but Putin is the real player in Russia, they basically understood that they can, they have to curb political freedom, freedom of information in order to stay in power. So if the United States goes over and said, why don't you guys have a more transparent news information, they are basically uh, running a very strong danger of uh, running, <laughs> basically undermining the basic tenant of the Russian government, the basic source of power, which is the lack of information. Uh, and the United States needs uh, Russia. It needs it desperately. It needs it for China. It needs it for Iran. It needs it for India. Right? So if you do a cost-benefit analysis, freedom of information in Russia is uh, a great issue for people in Russia who care about these things, but uh, a very small stake for American foreign policy. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to uh, clarify one point earlier. There is still actually a, a, a peace demonstration, an anti-war demonstration in the Veterans Park every Monday here in the city. Um, and they have, to my knowledge, never defaced a monument. So I, did, I just thought that I'd, I'd toss that out there. That might bring some comfort. But anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, to our uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Professors Vrusic, Bai, Johnson, and Gillum. Thank you all very thank much. You. Thank you, pleasure, sir. sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Good job. Good job. You know, you're not careful. You can learn things. You can learn stuff at things.